Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Catherine Robson. Um, Catherine is a geneticist at the Wetherall Institute in Oxford University with a particular interest in hemochromatosis. And Catherine works with uh, Patricia Bignall, who's over there. <laughs> and uh, a pair of more enthusiastic people for their subject I've yet to meet. I spent a good part of an afternoon with them at Oxford in January. And to be honest, I think we could have sat there all day uh, with me just buoyed by their enthusiasm. Uh, certainly I could anyway, but I think they probably had a lot of better things to do. The work is... The work they do is cutting edge and hugely beneficial to the hemochromatosis community. So here's Catherine with an introduction to genetics and inheritance patterns in GH. Well, to start, a big thank you to the organisers for inviting us to present our data. A lot of the talks today were very similar to the talks yesterday, but my talk is actually quite different to the talk that Patricia gave yesterday. And what I was asked to do was try and explain genetics to a non-scientific audience. Now, I have to start by saying I breed pedigree cats as a hobby, and this talk has been based on a talk I gave to a cat club because they too wanted to understand genetics, and in their problem, in the cat breed, was a heart disease, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Well, basically, what you're doing is you're taking dad, mum, and you're coming up with progeny and you've got the two stripes in different directions giving you this checkered. And it's that pattern <laughs> that is what we've got to interpret. And you mightn't get, end up getting checks like that. You could get a different check pattern. Right, well, what's the history of genetics? It's a relatively young biological science. It's just over 150 years old. And you may have heard of someone called Gregor Mendel, and he was the first person who did studies in peas, looking to see whether they were smooth or wrinkled or tall or, part, or tall or small. And he was the one who proposed the existence of genes, which he called factors. Basically, a gene codes for a protein. Humans have over 20,000 genes. And each chromosome contains many thousand genes, and chromosomes are made up of DNA and protein. Right, so how many chromosomes do we have? We have, as humans, 46 chromosomes. A cat will have 38, so we're different to them. But they come in pairs, and you have sex chromosomes as well, and one chromosome, one of each pair, is inherited from each parent, and that's important. And you can get clever scientists who come up with ways of, of painting chromosomes. So you can pair them up, and you can say, this yellow one, is, a, is these are chromosome pair of chromosome 1, chromosome 2, and so on and so forth. They get smaller as the numbers get higher. So what do genes do? They provide instructions. Like that instruction manual you get when you have that self-pack from Ikea. It says, read the instructions, and you've got that rather crazy diagram, and you think, is, is that A or is that B? Well, basically, the DNA code is four building blocks. They're abbreviated A, G, C, and T. And they're made up into little threesomes. A codon is three of these building blocks. It could be GAT, it could be GGG. But each of these codons codes for one of the building blocks of a protein called an amino acid. Now, what is... How do you tell proteins apart? Do they have different roles in the body? They can be structural. These are the ones on your skin. They hold you together. They can be catalysts. They speed up the reaction, put your foot down on your accelerator, get things done. They can be factory workers. They can be part of a production line. They can be defense systems. You've all heard of antibodies and having H5N1 flu and you need antibodies and who's got what antibodies against what flu. And if you saw it 10 years ago, you're going to get flu now or whatever's going on. But they can also be part of a management team. And this is where insulin comes in. Insulin manages your glucose levels. Hepcidin or hepcidin, depending on what you want to call it. And if you're British, it tends to be hepcidin, but I noticed that Ted called it hepcidin. The Americans tend to call it hepcidin with a nice broad draw. They are the management team. They are saying, hey, slow down, speed up, slow down, speed up. Now, people get slightly confused about congenital disorders and inherited disorders. Congenital disorders 
are quite often developmental. They're a one-off. It's just bad luck. And they very often manifest at birth or soon after. What I'm talking about with hemochromatosis is it's an inherited disorder. They're due to errors in the DNA. They're generally inherited from one or both parents, but we have had a patient with a de novo HFE mutation. So neither of his parents had it, and it just appeared. And it may manifest at birth or much later, and that's true in hemochromatosis. So mutations are alterations in the DNA code. They come in different types, deletions, insertions, missense, nonsense. And in some instances, they change the instructions. Right, this is where the cat bit comes in. The sentence is, the cat has a black mate. Right, if you have a deletion, that can become, the cat has a black mat. Not quite the same sense. If it's got an insertion, the cart has a black mate. And those last two sentences sort of make sense because the individual words are words we recognize. But if you put them together, they don't make the sense to give you the instructions. Now, missense and nonsense mutations are slightly different. The sentence here again is the cat had a black mate. The rat had a black mate. Well, that still makes sense, but it's got a subtly different meaning. The hat has a black mate makes not really any sense at all. And the cat has a and the foot, foot, full stops arrive too early, that's your nonsense mutation. Now, these genes have something in common. That's HFE, the HFE gene you've all heard of. SLC40A1 hasn't really had a mention here. That's the ferroportin gene. It's got the code SLC40A1. HAMP is the code for the hepcidin gene. HFE2 is the code for the hemojuvalin gene. There's transferrin receptor 2. There's a gene which we knew was likely to be involved in iron metabolism and because the mutant mouse, the mutant for BMP6 had iron loading, but we took time to find it and it's only recently been found that mutations in that protein can give rise to iron loading. Much rarer forms, there's another protein called seroloplasmin and the ferritin light chain. So they give rise to different forms of iron overload. They may have just high ferritin. They could have high transferrin and high ferritin. But what the clue is here is they are part of a production line. They have a role in how the body manages iron and recycles it. The body is great at recycling iron. Now, we've had a various versions of this from different speakers, but basically, we take our iron from our diets in the duodenum, and then plasma transferrin, think of that as the DHL courier service in the body. It's moving iron around the body to where, oh, yes, I ordered this from Amazon or I ordered this from so-and-so. The recycling organ is the spleen. It's recycling those damaged red cells. Muscle requires iron because it's, it's, it, it has to do things with oxygen. And the storage organ is the liver. And as I say, this is the body's recycling system. And it's your ferritin in the liver and in the spleen that's actually storing the iron. Now, I have to thank my mother for the next slide. And you think, what on earth is she doing here? What I want to illustrate here is that you can have the same set of words, but you just move only systematically, that only I hit him in the eye yesterday. Nobody else did. I only hit him in the eye yesterday. Didn't slap him. I hit only him in the eye yesterday. Didn't hit you lot. I hit somebody else. But that is why the order of instructions in handling iron is key. And it just takes a spelling mistake in some of these, or just a shift, to actually change that set of instructions, and you can end up with iron overload. Now, gametes, what are these? These are the sperm and the egg cells. Each gamete has one copy of each chromosome, and when the egg's fertilized, the two of them come together, and you end up with chromosome pairs. Now, you can have dominant genes, and somebody stopped me this morning and sort of said, oh, I've got this father, uh, mother and son cat. I think, I think the person who was talking to me is gone. But basically, in the cat world, the dominant gene is the black or seal gene. I breed Siamese-type cats. 
Tabby genes are dominant, so you only need one copy from one parent to be either black or tabby. But if you've got something more special, you'll have combinations of genes. And if you've got one from one parent that's black and one from the other parent that happens to be dilute blue or grey, you're going to be a heterozygote for each of those. Recessive genes. In the cat world, these can be grey and blue genes. You don't see very many grey cats around. That's because it's recessive. It's like C282Y. C282Y, we know, is a recessive mutation. You need both copies of this mutation to be at risk of developing HIV hemochromatosis. You have to be a homozygote. And the HFE gene is localized to chromosome 6. Now, this is, I, I didn't have this slide in my talk yesterday, but I was asked to put this slide back. Basically, you've got two parents here, dad, mum. One's got a, a big B and a little B, okay? And this particular kitten has got big B, big B from daddy and mummy. And these two look identical. In fact, it's the same kitten photograph. But these are the ones who are carriers of the little bee, but they look identical to the kitten that doesn't have a little bee. On the other hand, the kitten that's got little bee from each parent is a little grey kitten. So that's your homozygote. So if we put that through to C282Y, we've got dad, mum, you've got a carrier, a carrier, normal, and someone who has hemochromatosis. So those are the four possible combinations. Genes work together. Now, this is a hobby horse of mine, and I think that's what Howard was referring to. Genetics is not the simple story we once thought it was. And several years ago in Oxford, we discovered that in hemochromatosis, it was diagenic inheritance was also a key explanation of the disease. These are the poor heterozygotes who get told, yeah, you've got a high ferritin, you've got a high transferrin saturation. You've only got one copy of C282, why go away? We won't treat you. You haven't got hemochromatosis, because by definition, to have hemochromatosis, you have to have two copies of C282Y. Wrong. It's something's gone wrong in that logistics process, and we've got to understand that the hepcidin, synthesis, hepcidin cycle is managing the logistics. And it might not just be C282, why you have to look, look at it. And it could, think of it as a production line. You slow down here because you're running out of that supply. You slow down there and your production levels go right the way down. And that's what's happening with hepcidin. HFE is reducing the amount of hepcidin you make. But something else, like a minor hepcidin mutation, it's only one copy, but it reduces the hepcidin level still further. And it's that combination. What we've been able to do, thanks to funding from the National Institute for Health Research in Oxford, we've had money from what's locally known as the BRC, and this is what Patricia was talking about yesterday, was next generation sequencing. And this has revolutionised our ability to diagnose non-HFE hemochromatosis. It allows us to look in parallel at 16 genes involved in the way the body controls iron levels. It allows us to reduce the time it takes to diagnose, where we used to have to sequence one gene at a time. We can do all 16 at once, and because we can do all 16 at once, it reduces the cost. And now that we've set the panel up, it's not trivial, but it's a relatively straightforward thing for us to run patients through it. And I think the, the cost is likely to be in future about £500. So what are the genes on the panel? These are our 16 favourite iron genes. You've all heard about HFE. This is one of the juvenile genes, and this is the other juvenile genes. These are much rarer forms. Ferroportin disease is where you have a high ferritin, but a normal transferrin saturation. But you can have what's known as type 4B, which clinically is indistinguishable from classical HFE hemochromatosis. And if you happen to have one of those ferroportin mutations, you'd be told, yeah, you don't have hemochromatosis. You aren't a C282Y homozygote. There are rarer forms, seropasmin. Patricia talked about these yesterday. We had three patients that came along in a very quick succession. And I want to say, am I right in saying, Patricia, they were all Asians? Um, 
And this is the other thing is, it's, we've been talking about Celtic disease. What we know from the samples that come through Oxford is it's a much more mixed population because we are in the UK now a mixed population. 80% of the unloaded samples that come through the diagnostic laboratory are the classic C2A2Y homozygotes. 20% are not. And those are the patients who are told, you don't have two copies of C2A2Y, go away, get lost. You don't have it, you don't need treatment. We're trying to say, actually, look at the fact they've got the high ferritin, look at the fact they've got a transferrin saturation, treat them, go then look for a mutation. We may not know what those mutated genes are, but what we are finding in the Pakistani community in living in the UK, hemoduvalin and hepstein mutations. Europeans with mutations in those genes present with heart disease, iron loading, hemochromatosis. But the Asians are presenting with infertility and diabetes. They're not presenting with the heart disease. Right, now, in your packs, you should have an envelope. This is where we play a game. So if you'd like to open your envelopes. Okay, and I'm trusting that you can find your envelopes. Right, you should have two colored pieces of paper. One is red and one is blue. And the blue one is the gamut you got from your dad. And the red one is the gamut you got from mum. Put them together. And I'd like to have a show of arms, please. Who's got H63D? Okay. Who's got one copy of C282Y? Okay. Who's got two copies of H63D? Okay. Who's got two copies of C282Y? Okay. So you're the he classical hemochromatosis patients. Now, there should be some of you who've got either a hemoduvalin mutation, a ferroportin mutation, or a transferrin receptor 2 mutation. Okay? You're the guys who currently are told you don't have hemochromatosis, go away. Okay? And that's what the message that we're trying to get through is that you may have combinations of mutations in the different genes or mutations in other genes that will give iron loading, and you need treating. Thank you very much.